Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. And what a roller coaster this past week has been. Explosive testing down at Starbase with an unusual turn of events at the launch pad. Falcon 9 broke its own landing record twice. NASA successfully returned samples from asteroid Bennu and also shared a bunch of new Artemis updates. And we unfortunately saw two orbital launch failures. Let's jump right in. Over at Starbase, we saw a destructive test last week and the demise of test article Ship 26.1. On Thursday, SpaceX began the cryogenic pressure test to failure and, well, there it goes. You can see that the structural failure caused the tank to shoot upwards, which suggests that the point of failure happened towards the prototype tank's lower section. Let's hope the structural failure occurred after the tank passed all the margins SpaceX are hoping it to. Booster 10 was rolled back from the Macy's test facility after a successful round of repellent load testing and thrust simulation testing. Sean Doherty of NASA Spaceflight captured some fantastic shots of the booster during its Sunday cryoproofing. Major props there. Anyway, after leaving Macy's, the booster arrived back at the Mega Bay on Wednesday, and later in the day, it was placed on the Raptor engine installation stand, ready to begin receiving its 33 Raptor 2 engines. It was moved to the stand from the booster thrust simulator stand, which was then moved out of the Mega Bay shortly after Booster 10 was removed, returning to the Macy's test site until it's needed again. Over the next few weeks, Booster 10 will now begin Raptor engine installation and presumably hot ring installation at some point down the line as well, in addition to all the other remaining hardware required to get this vehicle flight ready. NASA Spaceflight's Jack Bayer caught the arrival of some CO2 tanks at the build area, which will potentially be for Booster 10's fire suppression system. Moving on to updates at the launch site, the water deluge system recently underwent some fairly significant modifications. And throughout last week, we saw the arrival of water trucks to the site, refilling the tanks that were drained for the modification works. On suborbital pad B, Starship tanker prototype Ship 26 has been hooked up to a crane for a little while now, but last week it was finally disconnected. We're not sure what's next in line for this vehicle, but it's expected that the reason it's here is for static fire testing at some point. After being unhooked from Ship 26, the crane was then relocated to the orbital launch pad where, curiously, it was then attached to Booster 9. What? <laughs> yep, it was attached to the top of the booster and then promptly removed the recently installed hot staging ring. This was certainly an unexpected development, and it's not clear why SpaceX decided to do this. This is absolutely only going to be a temporary removal though. Remember that the ship quick disconnect arm has been modified to account for the increased booster height that the hot staging ring causes, so either SpaceX removed it to make additional modifications, conduct more tests, or simply expose the top of Booster 9 for work crews. It all remains to be seen. But why remove such a crucial piece of hardware so close to launch? According to Elon, SpaceX has completed all the changes required by the FAA, so surely things must be pretty close now. Well, no, actually. The other government body that needs to grant approval is the US Fish and Wildlife Service. We'd hoped that this would be fairly quick, given not a huge amount has changed from Orbital Launch 1, aside from, of course, the new water deluge system. Well, purportedly, the Fish and Wildlife Agency hasn't actually started their formal review of SpaceX's upgrades, and in an email to Bloomberg News, they stated the review could take anywhere from 30 to 135 days. It's a bit of a wonder why the review hasn't started yet, and clearly the news frustrated not just Starship fans, but Elon himself, flatly stating on X that this is unacceptable, and that it's absurd that SpaceX can build a giant rocket faster than the Fish and Wildlife Agency can shuffle papers. The Ring Watchers, who you should definitely be following by the way, did point out that the construction of Ship 25 actually took 237 days, and Booster 9 260 days, though of course SpaceX have got a lot faster in rocket ship production since these vehicles both began fabrication. But an interesting tidbit nonetheless. <laughs> As for boosters under construction, the stacking of Booster 13 continued throughout the week, and in the high bay we got a good glimpse of Ship 29 as it was rolled to the centre of the building on Thursday. It was later lifted onto the ship thrust simulator stand before being rolled out and transported to the Macy's test site for propellant load testing and structural testing with the thrust simulator. I know we all say this now every single time that SpaceX roll out a new Starship, but man, this new vehicle's heat shield has got to be the cleanest one yet. The Star Factory building is progressing well, workers continued construction of the building's steel frame, the taller segment of the building there will be where ship nose cones will be fabricated. 
SpaceX conducted three Falcon 9 Starlink V2 mini launches last week. The first was on Wednesday, launching from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. This was one for the history books though, because the booster used for this mission, Booster 1058, had previously flown 16 missions, and if it stuck the landing this time, it would set a new booster landing record. And it did! Shortly after stage separation, it touched down on the shortfall of Gravitas drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. I wonder if we'll ever see a 20th booster landing at some point. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. I mean, 17 though, it's getting pretty close. The other two Starlink missions took place yesterday and today, the 24th and 25th of September. Yesterday's saw a Falcon 9 launch once again from Kennedy Space Launch Complex 40, with the first stage landing on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, Wait, for the 17th time again? Yes, that's two Falcon 9s now with 17 launches and landings under their belts. Incredible stuff. Today's Starlink mission used a slightly newer booster. This was only its sixth mission overall. It launched from the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, and the first Sage successfully landed on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship located in the Pacific Ocean. We have a lot of Artemis updates this week. For starters, the crew of Artemis 2 are seen in this photo taken last Wednesday as part of an integrated ground systems test at the Kennedy Space Center, which ensures that the ground systems team is ready to support the crew timeline on the launch day. You can see the crew wearing test versions of the Orion Crew Survival System spacesuits that will be worn for the launch. In order to launch, they're going to need a rocket, and to that end, the SLS for Artemis 2 is really starting to approach completion. NASA boss Bill Nelson shared these photos of engineers begin the installation progress of the four RS-25 engines on the rocket's core stage, adding that this mission around the moon will help lay the foundation for our long-term presence on the lunar surface for science and exploration. The solid rocket motors were spotted on the way to the Kennedy Space Center as well. Here they are being transported in segments on a train. And before you go getting ideas, guys, remember, do not hump. Do not hump the boosters. <laughs> the SLS rocket for Artemis 3 saw some updates as well last week. The upper interim cryogenic propulsion stage, or just ICPS, for Artemis 3's SLS was prepared for shipment from Alabama to Florida back in July, and last week NASA released this photo of the move. This ICPS is the last of its kind. Artemis 4 and onwards will use the bigger SLS Block 1B which will sport an upgraded upper stage. One mission to be excited about is the upcoming NASA Psyche mission, for two reasons. First, it's launching on Falcon Heavy, and who doesn't love a good Falcon Heavy launch? And secondly, the spacecraft itself will have a very interesting journey. It'll spend almost six years covering 3.6 billion kilometers to asteroid 16 Psyche, which orbits the Sun between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Scientists believe that Psyche could be part of the core of a planetesimal, a small planet-like celestial object that was destroyed after an impact with other bodies, leaving fragments of its core remaining in this case asteroid Psyche. It's likely made of iron-nickel metal, which can be studied from orbit to give researchers a better idea of what may make up Earth's core. I'll cover this mission in greater detail as the launch day approaches, which is currently set for the 5th of October. Last week, on Wednesday, the spacecraft was mated to the payload attach fairing inside the clean room at Astrotech Space Operations Facility in Titusville, Florida. Speaking of NASA asteroid missions, have you ever wondered what it looks like to grab rock samples off an asteroid? Well, here is real footage of just that. This was captured by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft as it performed its touch-and-go sample collection from asteroid Bennu back in October 2020. It then stowed the samples into a return module before beginning the long trip back to Earth. And yesterday, the return capsule was separated from the spacecraft and re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, touching down at the Utah Test and Training Range three minutes earlier than predicted. Here, you can see teams perform the initial safety assessment of the landed capsule. They're the first people to come into contact with this hardware, following its massive voyage through the solar system. It was then transported to a temporary clean room in Utah, where it will soon head to NASA's Johnson Space Center for curation and analysis of its 4.5 billion year old sample. Unfortunately, it wasn't all success stories last week. Rocket Lab experienced a loss of mission on their launch last Tuesday. This was the second of four dedicated electron launches for Capella Space, and the rocket carried Capella's Acadia 2 Earth observation satellite. The mission initially went well, but unfortunately failed to reach orbit following an anomaly with the second stage, resulting in loss of the vehicle and payload. 
Electron hasn't had a mission failure since May 2021, and Rocket Lab have confirmed that they're now working with the FAA to determine the root cause of the issue. We won't see any more Electron launches until the problem has been diagnosed. Hopefully, we'll see Rocket Lab back on their feet sooner rather than later. Electron wasn't the only rocket to suffer a launch failure last week. Chinese firm Galactic Energy's Ceres-1 also suffered loss of mission, though we don't have any footage of this launch yet, or possibly won't ever, so here's footage from a previous Ceres-1 launch. The rocket lifted off from the Chiquan Satellite Launch Center, carrying the GeoFen 04B remote sensing satellite, but according to Galactic Energy, the rocket flew abnormally and the launch mission failed. The specific reasons are further being analyzed and investigated. And that's about all we know. This was the first time a Ceres-1 launch vehicle suffered a launch failure, and in fact, this was the first launch failure for the whole of China this year. Prior to this mishap, the country has enjoyed 43 consecutive successful launches in 2023. Lao Aerospace had a successful, albeit wobbly, launch on Saturday. I decided to take advantage of KSP-2's less than complete state and land a surface base on Joule, which for some reason has a solid core beneath its cloud layer. It was a fun video to put together and was monstrously difficult for my PC to run, so I hope you enjoy watching me suffer. <laughs> it should hopefully be one of the clickable cards on screen, and of course also on screen are my Patreon and channel members whose generous support helps me keep the lights on around here. If you want to sign up, then your support is always hugely appreciated. And I guess that's it from me today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Space This Week, and I'll catch you in the next one.